Welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We're joined by Chris Flores of Seaflow Consulting. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, we have a super interesting story because Chris used or joined a startup called Namely early on, scaled with them or scaled with their sales department uh, over five years and has some really impressive numbers that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then since then has done various other things, but now is running Seaflow Consulting, which essentially is a consultancy consulting on sales departments and sales operations. So we're going to get here in the next 20, 30 minutes, experience from Namely, the Namely journey, yeah. but also experience from every other sales team you've been exposed to in the consulting work. Um, so super excited to dig into that. Before I ask the first question, oh no, actually, I'm going to ask the first question. How did you originally get into sales ops? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting because um, when I first started out at Namely, which is my first like exposure to this world of sales development, sales operations, um, I was the fourth employee in the first SDR. So that was back in June 2013. Um, oh, wow. Seems like it seems like a l very long time ago. Um, and at that moment. Uh, as the first SDR, I also was involved in buying Salesforce and all of the sales tools. And I was also like the admin. So when you're so young and you're only four or five people, you're scrapping and you're owning everything. Um, so it was a natural progression for me to, um, I always wanted to be in some type of management role. Uh, so as an SDR, I moved into SDR management, but I continued to own all things operations. So I was the owner of sales systems, optimizing things and buying and negotiating prices with, uh, with other vendors and whatnot. So I learned a lot from it. Um, and, and that's how I got my start, um, in sales ops. Got it. Um, and quick question, you were employee number four, what were the other, in which departments were the other employees? Yeah. So from? we had, so we had our, we had our founder, um, uh, head of engineering, um, and marketing. Uh, oh, wow. so, so we had those all early on and it was just like, there's so much overlap too, because it's so small and scrappy and just like we're doing everything, um, helping yeah. each other and, and whenever we can. Um, and like a few months after I joined, I remember that's where we raised the series A, um, in order to hire more, get a, get our own office space, um, start buying more technology, which was always fun and, uh, start hiring more people. Yeah. Got it. Good. And then to quickly while we're on that fast forward to the end of the namely journey because that was five years yeah uh, and you were being head of sales development but what was the size of the organization the size of the sales organization at that point yeah yeah so we, so i helped scale that company um from me being the first salesperson to at least 100 sales members so we had um a team of 30 sdrs a team of at least 60 account executives there were pre-sales sales engineers involved as well, and then managers all across the nation, and not just in New York where we started, um, in Austin, Georgia, um, in Atlanta, in Seattle, LA, and San Francisco as well. Um, so it's pretty big, pretty big sales org. And um, uh, since leaving, I'm still, I still try and keep in touch, and and I'm rooting for them because also have equity still for sure. And uh, uh, I think. Um, it's been it's been a wild ride to see the ups and downs of Series A, Series B, Series C, and building a, an entire sales organization from that. Got it. And the, the the size of the sales operations function when you left? Yeah, yeah. So when I left, it was I'd say it's around three or four. Um, there is uh, sales ops that worked very closely with marketing operations, um, yeah. as well as uh, an owner of all go to market operations and then on the c level side um or vp level we had a vp of revenue operations so we saw um, a business operations function being built out as well um but sales and marketing kind of um involved under one umbrella and what we called uh back then is revenue operations got it and then there was the head of revenue operations who then reported i guess into or the head of revenue yeah, yeah, the the chief revenue officer, and then directly uh, directly to the C, CEO. So it was actually a really good alignment because what we learned is that we should never separate sales operations and marketing operations, and then customer success operations because they all tied to the same numbers in in one way or another in terms of that one KPI of like ARR, MRR, just like revenue in general. 
Um, so having that all roll up into that one revenue operations role um, is pretty effective. And then, so, so this, this, the head of revenue, did the head of marketing and head of sales report into him or did they also report into the CEO? Yeah, in that relationship, they reported to the CEO, but it was it was sort of like everyone's in the same, uh, they're working in parallel um, as far okay. as uh, that, uh, how, how they kept their relationship going. Got it. Um, okay, so the next question we normally ask is about sales ops tech stack. Now, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that you, you wouldn't have a, a mature sales ops tech stack at FIFA Consulting. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, you're right. Yep. <laughs> um, so from your experience, either at Namely or from other clients that you're working with, um, what would you would you say is like best practice? Uh, what are the tools that you would need uh, yeah. to have a functioning sales operation? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think, and you've probably heard this for, for everyone you've asked the question, uh, from a CRM perspective at Salesforce, um, if you're not on Salesforce, then uh, especially as a consultant, I will push you to go on to Salesforce if you want to become a, a, you know, a, a world-class inside sales team, in my opinion. Um, but from a prospecting perspective, my favorites is um, uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, uh, Zoom Info, or Discover Org. I know they're, they're one company at the moment. Very, very powerful contact data is one of my favorites to, um, to always recommend. And then in sales engagement perspective, I like either Outreach or Sales Loft. Um, they kind of go neck and neck depending on the size of the, the company, but they're very, very strong tools. Um, and uh, I'm very familiar with them and the reps that I've trained, um, they typically always have really positive feedback on that end. And then there's always a data management piece as well as part of the sales stack. Um, one of my favorites is a company called InCycle, which helps with uh, managing duplicates, um, cleaning Excel spreadsheets, importing, exporting, um, not just between uh, you know, spreadsheets and, and Salesforce, but also like HubSpot, Marketo, and other tools that you have within your stack. Uh, so I think that data management piece is super important and to have something dedicated to that, um, which in my recommendation is always in cycle, is powerful. Got it. Um, and so that leads very nicely onto the next question, which is about uh, dealing with data quality. Um, so we have this tool here that I, I guess can retroactively fix data problems. Yeah. But what else do you recommend to clients, or that you did it, namely, to improve data quality generally? Yeah, yeah, you'll definitely need, you, you, you're going to need an owner, first of all. Um, I've seen, and this happened at Namely very early on as well, and a lot of my clients, where it's marketing is in charge, or sales operations are, is in charge, or they give it to the IT person, because um, nobody wants to deal with it. It's just so messy, and it's a pain. It really is. So. Um, I always, I love data. I love dealing with it and, and doing, doing whatever it takes to fix it. Um, so as it's, you treat it as a cadence, um, whether it's every month or every quarter, you need some type of dedicated resource and some type of tool where you have your um, duplicate checks. Um, you're making sure that AEs and SDRs have the right amount of accounts. They're, right, they're in your target market. Um, all of these types of things, sort of like a, let's clean up our room every single month and let's clean up our space every single quarter. Um, I mean, that's, that's super important. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when I, when I typically go in, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much the person who owns it. Um, and I, I keep that under the umbrella of sales operations because we also know what type of data we want. Um, marketing can help and, and they, of course they will know. Um, but uh, sales is, is actively engaging with it. They take inbounds, they take outbounds and um, it's something I think we can control. So do you think the sales ops team should be responsible for data quality? Agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, moving on to getting buy-in or getting the sales team to, to do something that you want them to do. Do you have any tips or best practices uh, around that? Force them. <laughs> Force them to do it. No exceptions. Uh, no, yeah, I've been, I've been through a lot of uh, tech implementations and ripping things out, replacing, or, or getting something new. I think the best is when you have a team that, um, like at Namely, for example, we, have a, we, we had a benefits brokerage division, and um, there's a lot of these old school benefit brokers have amazing experience in benefits, but Salesforce is blowing their mind. And like these reports are blowing their mind and sales engagement tools. So that was always fun. Those are the easiest ones. 
And then the toughest guys and gals are the ones where, you know, they, they're used to using a specific tool. They're comfortable. You know, we're creatures of habits um, from a sales perspective, and it's hard for them to, uh, to adopt something new. Um, so what I do is, one, I get them involved early in the process, give them as much of a heads up as I can. Um, I would uh, involve them in, in a pilot, if, if that's possible, with a specific vendor, um, get a few champions involved, find out who's the loudest person in the room and get that person involved first and early, you know, and, but also show them the data because now, you know, we're a bunch of millennials running companies, which is great. And numbers don't lie. And we understand that. So it's important for me to, to show them ahead of time before we, uh, uh, we adopt a brand new tool or we implement a new tool uh, that this can work. And, and here are the numbers, numbers won't lie for you. Um, and then the, I think one, one of the key things that people, uh, that I work with forget as well is if they don't do all of the above, at least if you disagree, at least walk away with an agreement to commit. You know, if you're disagreeing on a tool, if you're disagreeing on a new process, at least tackle that head on with those specific reps or managers and say, can we at least agree that we're going to commit to this for the next quarter? Um, and if it doesn't work, then all right, we'll go back to the drawing board. So I think if you follow that type of process, like I'm, I'm a big checklist guy, if you follow that every single time for a new tool or process, then you're good. Got it. And I haven't, we haven't actually heard that before about even if people don't agree, we can still get people to commit for a specific period of time just to, to allow, I guess, allow you the time to see if the data does yeah. work out so you can then commit some of the data. Um, to, just writing that down. Um, you must have onboarded a vast number of new reps at, at Namely. What are like your best practices for doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I've onboarded um, a ton and have learned a lot, especially as a first time manager, one, understanding what it means to become a manager versus individual contribution, uh, an individual contributor, um, and not really hiring yourself, but hiring that person for the right skills and the right talent and the role. Yeah, there's culture ad, there's um, coachability, adaptability, and all, all these different KPIs. Um, I've made, I've also made some wrong hires, right? I've made some hires that didn't work out, whether it's like during the ramp period or the year in, and, and it just wasn't aligned. So, um, from that perspective, what's super, super important, it's, you know, is their first two weeks when we talk about onboarding. I love the quick and dirty two week onboard. Um, but what's, what's super, super important is just a reinforcement training as well. Everyone. I mean, sometimes I forget about it as well. You know, it's just one of those things where if you're fast growing and you hired your first SDR, your first AD, as your hiring manager, as the CEO, you want that person closing deals right away. But it's just never going to work that way. Um, you have to give them time. You have to give them all the right tools and resources, but also reinforce it a, a week later, another week later, and like keep going. Um, so I think that's, that's super important. I like to overwhelm all of my reps for the first two weeks because they're also hungry. They come in with that new hire um, energy. They're hungry, they're ready to go. But the reinforcement training is super important. And also if, you're, if you have the luxury of having other reps involved, if you have team leaders, if you have SDRs that are veterans or account executives that are veterans, involve them in the onboarding process as well. Have them with shadowing and, and running prospecting tips and tricks, best practices, um, uh, uh, doing demos side by side, running demos parallel, whatever it may be, um, that's that's super important. So I think if you screw up the onboarding, um, it's like screwing up your your GPA in college very early on, and you're you're, you're playing catch up um, from uh, uh, from a very low end, trying to get get back up to the top. It's a tough it's a tough thing to do. It's a grind. Yeah. Um, moving on to sales forecasting. Do you have any best practices for building an accurate forecast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it, it comes down to first, um, first making sure that you have the same language amongst uh, SDRs, AEs, managers, and then C-level. Uh, and that's very important because what the CEO may see or what your VP of sales might see or say 
can be completely different. I see the breakdown in communication all the time. Um, so understanding what the stages are in Salesforce, um, as well as what the probability per stage looks like. 10% for first stage, 30% for second, 40, 50, whatever it may be. Um, once you get the once you get that nailed down, like then it's a lot easier to to figure out what's upside, what's commit, and then you know what it's kind of like a swing deal. And the way the way I like I like to simplify things um, from a forecasting perspective. If and I'm an account executive and I go into a meeting with a VP of sales, I want to be able to tell that person confidently what can I close um, this month or this quarter. Um, what do I think can come in? Um, you know, what's my upside? What, what, you know, what's the best case scenario? And then what are the one or two deals that if they happen to swing in, then I can knock out my quota in the park. And that AE should be able to see that within Salesforce um, as well as the VP of sales. So I think it just comes down to data and it comes down to speaking the same language and understanding that what you tell me is reportable. It's in it's in Salesforce. You've updated it. Um, we've maintained it, and my C, my CEO can see it. My VP of Sales can see it. My ops guy can see it as well. Got it. Quick question from the audience. Uh, we have Zach. How do you approach the process of filtering leads from marketing to sales? Cool. Cool. Yeah. So um, from that perspective. <clears throat> It's all about the types of fields that we use. So my my favorite marketing automation at the moment is HubSpot um, and aligning that with Salesforce. Um, so one simple way to do it, it's everything that comes into Salesforce from a marketing perspective, we treat those as leads. And then everything that comes in from outbound and, and, and our SDRs and AEs are practically going out, I actually have them create accounts and contacts. And we do some of a, an account-based sales or account-based marketing model. So that's one easy way. And then um, also by source. So there's plenty of automation that you can build in uh, as leads enter the system, you tag them as inbound, you give them their appropriate lead source, and then you train your outbound uh, sales team to do the same when they're creating contacts. Um, uh, there's a lead source for outbound, there's specific account sources and whatnot. And uh, you build a playbook around that. You get everyone in line and from the onboarding, just like this is inbound, this is outbound. Um, and that's how uh, you're able to create that filter um, and, and funnel in. And it makes, it, it makes reporting a lot easier, in my opinion, too. So we currently here, so we use Salesforce and then Pardot as marketing automation. Okay. Um, obviously, Pardot's owned by Salesforce. And so that integration is pretty tight. I actually, like, I'm a big helpful fan. I've never actually used it, but I, like, the brand is amazing. Yeah. Is that integration between HubSpot and Salesforce like, have you ever had any, any issues integrating with two or is everything all good? Yeah, I think early on, definitely. I just finished up a HubSpot implementation for, for a new client and um, getting the forms one, getting the forms on the website, it's, it's a bit tricky. I'm not a marketer by trade. I'm more of a sales ops and on, on the sales side and Salesforce. Um, uh, but once once you figure out all the kinks, then it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly easy. I, I have heard that part dot because they're so native and built into the Salesforce that makes it a little bit more powerful. I haven't used it um, at all, actually, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'll keep it that way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, making sales reps productive. Yeah. Thoughts. Yeah. Um, early on, it definitely starts in the onboarding. Uh, I like to give in my first two weeks of onboarding too. There's there's always homework. There's always something that they can be doing. The best when when I make the when I know I made a really good hire. If I'm a sales rep or I'm an inside sales rep, I'm an SDR versus AE. It's the ones where I fill up their calendar every single day, and then at the end of the day, they always ask for feedback or they always ask like, what else could I be doing? And I love that, even though we're overwhelming them with with, with so much. Um, so every week. Uh, within their onboarding process or every day. I also give them some homework, which is like building up your pipeline, cleaning things up. We'll, we'll give you 500, 500 brand new accounts to start with, like start prospecting into those accounts. Start thinking about messages because you're going to do this anyways. Um, so do it. So getting them used to the fact that you will always have action items um, after you have a meeting with your manager or me uh, so that we're always pushing and moving forward. That's the best way to 
to keep them productive. And then now we fast forward to three months or six months from now, 12 months, especially if we focus on the SDR function. Um, you know, SDR is a life cycle. It's what, 12, 14, maybe 18 months if you're lucky. When I was in SDR, I did it for six months and I wanted to kill myself because I was very, I was like, I want to be a manager. I was young. I, you know, I, I, I see the upside at Namely. Like, I want to make more money. I want this. I want to go, go, go. Um, but also there was burnout because every single day as an SDR, you talk to people who don't want to talk to you, right? You're cold calling, you're cold emailing, and you're, you're hustling. Uh, that's what you do. And I love and I appreciate the role. Um, so how do you keep Chris motivated back then? It's you need to give me more action items, right? You got to keep me productive. Um, you have to motivate me and coach me through the, the weekly one-on-ones, um, but also jump on issues like very fast, like the little things. Your job as a leader is to remove obstacles every single day as quickly as you can, no matter what it takes. And I found that I always gravitated towards the best leaders, CEOs, VPs of sales who invest time and they do that. Something very simple. If I see an AE or an SDR talk to their VP of sales and one of my clients and the VP of sales is heads down focus and doesn't even look at him while he's asking the question, like that's, we need to change that. You need to put the computer down, address them and have a conversation. Like all these little things are very, very important. It could be like, Hey, my sales force isn't working or my outreach is down. My LinkedIn, you know, my password expired. I need your help. Like little things you got to jump on them. So I think all of that involved with motivating and coaching them. And giving them that real feedback can keep your SDRs happy. You can get them a lot more productive. It'll keep your AEs happy. It'll be more productive. And um, they'll go to war for someone who goes to war for them. And I think that's super important. Nice. Um, KPIs. Yeah. What do you think? uh, The question I'd like to ask is, if you could measure uh, any rep with one KPI, you could only choose one, um, which would you choose? I would choose new higher ramp time. Um, and that's that's my favorite. It's one of the hardest because it varies by, by company. It's different mm-hmm. um, by your target market. If you're an enterprise, it could be longer. If you're small, tra- transactional, smaller uh, businesses that you're selling into, it could be a lot faster. But I want to be able to find what's the sweet spot? How quickly can I get my account executives or my SDRs to hit quota and not just hit quota that for that first month, but to hit it consistently, whether it's by monthly quota or quarterly quota. And if I can find out what that number is um, and find that perfect formula, then I want to apply that to everyone who comes in. And on top of that, typically when you have someone who hits that aggressive ramp time and, and, and is strong and can, can, can kind of like, run their own territory, it's their own business, they're the CEO of their own company, Um, you don't really need to to kind of like sit with them every single day. You don't need to babysit them, right? You don't need to worry about, hey, are they gonna get this task done? Are they going to hit their quota? You kind of get to lay off a bit, but also use them for training and and shadowing and helping you out as a manager because you're gonna be so busy. Um, So I would pinpoint that to new hire. New higher ramp. It's it's definitely my favorite KPI at the moment. Nice. That's the first time you've had that one. Oh, cool. Um, and final question is: Who taught you the most, or has inspired you the most in sales operations? Um, predictable revenue. Aaron Ross and Mary Lou Tyler. Uh, that was the first book I read um, as soon as I got the position to work as an SDR at Namely, and Previous to that, I was actually in life insurance. I was selling life accident health insurance for a company called Northwestern Mutual. And um, it was like a commission only gig. I was knocking on doors. I was running into, I was throwing business cards underneath, you know, lawyers and investment bankers offices. I just hustle, that's it. And that's all I knew was pick up the phone and grind. Um, But then when I read Predictable Revenue, uh, it made so much sense to me because there was a perfect balance of art and science and sales. Um, it was an, it was an easy, easier read. Uh, and I actually met Mary Lou Tyler, um, at a workshop that I did, I think it was about a year ago. And 
she, um, she was involved in the workshop as well. And every time I said something, she would echo what I would say. And we were always on the same page. Um, but I didn't get a chance to, um, to, to hang out with her afterwards. Um, so I, I'd like to, to close that loop and, and get in touch with her again, because I think we're on the same wavelength here. But, um, but yeah, that's a favorite book. I think that's the sales Bible um, that, 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 that I'm living by at the moment. We will link to that below. Um, yeah. So let me highlight a few things I enjoyed. Um, probably my favorite thing you said, I think, was people will go for war for, for someone that will go for war for them. Do you know what I mean? People will go to war for someone that will go to war for them. Yeah. And even that small example you gave about the people sales, like not giving attention to an AE, I think that's super super important um involving when you're trying to roll, roll out a new process involving the loudest reps can be useful to do that um and then adding process and then yeah and yeah, getting the timeline to commit so let's yeah. say you have a new process um people don't really like it getting people to commit to a certain amount of time to give you the data to then go back and say actually this is this is working and we should do this um many insights chris Thank you so much. Um, and I would urge people, we'll, we'll link to LinkedIn and we'll also link to FeeFlow um, either above or below this video. Um, I'd urge people to go and check Chris out uh, to learn more. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much.